Okay, we began last week a study of Jehoshaphat in Ahab's court because it is an example that we can use to study the question of open fellowship, which is an error that is very common among the children of God today. And um, we are going to continue that today. But I will remind you of the principles uh, that we're, that are being addressed here. And I do use the word principle um, in, intentionally. The fact is that in Hebrews 6, verses 1 through 3, the idea of the laying on of hands is the idea of fellowship. It's what you approve of, what you um, appoint or set in place. That's the laying on of hands. In Hebrews 6, 1 through 3, this is in a list of things that are called the elementary doctrine of Christ a foundation that has already been laid before a person goes on to maturity. And in the other, the other things in this list include teachings about baptism, teaching about the impending judgment, about repentance from dead works to the living God. These are all fundamental principles, elementary things. Well, foundational also is this teaching about fellowship, the laying on of hands. It should be a simple matter, rather than have complicated it. And 1 Timothy 5 is the record of what Paul told Timothy in the presence of God, verse 21 begins, and of Christ Jesus and of the elect angels, I charge you to keep these rules without judging ahead of time, doing nothing from partiality. Do not be hasty in the laying on of hands, nor take part in the sins of others. Keep yourself pure. It's clear what it means to lay on hands. And now he says, don't be hasty. Think about what you're doing. Uh, consider why you might uh, partake in this thing or um, take up the hands of somebody who is doing a teaching or a work. You need to think about what that is so that you're not partaking in the sins of others. For our study with Ahab um, and Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat was confronted by Jehu with a prophetic word from God when he said in 2 Chronicles 19.3, Should you help the wicked and love those who hate the Lord? And that's really the, the simplest way of describing I think, is the simplest way of describing this elementary principle. Who should we be concerned for? Whom should we serve? You know, Where should the loyalties be? It needs to be with God, not with those who hate God. And that's the thing. Our alignment should be with the Lord. Well, we spoke uh, as well about the fact that you may recall that Jehoshaphat was actually a good king for the most part. He did many things that were very good, and his overall life was considered to be uh, that of a good, a good king of Judah. Uh, there were some things he did that he should not have done, which we might look at quickly um, or in summary, but chief among these is the marriage alliance with Ahab. In 2 Chronicles 18.1, after all the good things that you read about him, then you read that he made a marriage alliance with Ahab, king of Israel, whose wife was Jezebel and was probably the real king. This is a serious problem. He should not have done this. And we are looking, um, we looked at the good, we looked at the bad last night, or I'm sorry, last time we met at night, <laughs> last week at this time. Um, tonight we look at the ugly. We have looked at the good and the bad. It is now the time to look at the ugly. And by this, uh, we mean uh, it's one thing for him to have made the marriage alliance that he did. And, and you know, 
one thing to have learned his lesson in some sense when the Lord defeated his plan to build ships with Ahab's son. It's another thing to look at what happened because of his stance, making um, some kind of a pact or agreement, making a compromise with those who hate the Lord. That's what's ugly. So Second Chronicles 21 and 22 is where, uh, you know, that's where we'll spend the uh, rest of our time on this topic or on this, uh, what is this, episode, incident, whatever, this thing that happened with Jehoshaphat. So there comes a time when Jehoshaphat passes away, and he has lots of sons. And the record says in Second Chronicles 21, beginning at verse 3, their father, who is Jehoshaphat, gave them great gifts of silver, gold, valuable possessions, together with fortified cities in Judah. But he gave the kingdom to Jehoram, because Jehoram was the firstborn. Well, that makes sense. So he's taking care of his sons. They have possessions. They have fortified cities. I mean, they're, they're well off. They're sons of the king. They should be so um, suited, I guess. But uh, Jehoram, as the firstborn, is made the king. He names his son Jehoram. Uh, the fourth verse records, When Jehoram had ascended the throne of his father and was established, he killed all his brothers with the sword, and also some of the princes of Israel, not just in Judah, but also in Israel. He had killed. That's interesting. Uh, Jehoram, not a very nice guy. This is not a great start for him. The way that he thinks he should hold on to power uh, after his father has already enriched his brothers with possessions and fortified cities, he thinks the way that he should hold on to power is to murder them, which he did. It's interesting, too, that he has, on ascending to the throne of Judah the power to cause some of the princes of Israel to die. That's interesting. Why does the king of Judah, the new king of Judah, have the power to kill people in Israel? Hmm. That's weird, don't you think? He shouldn't have this kind of an influence. Why does he have that? What is his connection and what purpose does that serve in the service of God? Well, nothing. It has nothing to do with God. God didn't tell him to do any of this. Fifth and sixth verses continue. He had been 32 years old at the time he became king. He reigned for eight years after becoming king. He walked in the way of the kings of Israel as the house of Ahab had done because the daughter of Ahab was his wife. And he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. That's not what Jehoshaphat had done. Jehoshaphat had done right as a rule. He certainly made mistakes. This was one of them. Should never have made this marriage alliance. We read that he made one. We didn't know what it was. Here it is. He married his son to the daughter of Ahab. So now the king of Israel is his father-in-law. And then he becomes the king. They're trying to use family ties to unite these things. And the impetus, I guess, or the uh, instinct to look for unity is good, but unity should be based on the word of God, not on family ties and societal, societal norms, governing authority, whatever else that might be, they should have been unified in serving the Lord their God according to the commandment as uh, uh, recorded by Moses. But they didn't have that unity because Ahab wanted nothing to do with God. There would never be unity with Ahab because he refused to obey God. 
But see, people don't, I, you know, people don't see it that way. They say, well, there should be peace. Families should get along. People should be able to find a way. Like, hmm, no. If they don't respect God, why are they going to respect you? If they don't fear God, if they're not honest about what they teach, um, knowing that God listens, why do you think they'll be honest with you? You shouldn't think this way, friend. There are some times when you simply cannot have peace. What the scripture says is, make peace with all men, so much as depends on you. Not, not all of it depends on you. It's a two-way street. So Jehoram, you know, is thinking that he's bringing unity to the kingdoms by killing his brothers and some of the leaders of Israel. That's unfortunate. Eleventh verse of Second Chronicles 21, Jehoram also made high places in the hill country of Judah and led the inhabitants of Jerusalem into whoredom. He made Judah go astray. That's 2 Chronicles 21, 11. Jehoram made high places in the hill country of Judah. Hmm. I thought they already had high places in the hill country of Judah. Well, they did, but Jehoshaphat took them down in 2 Chronicles 17, verse 6. Jehoshaphat, the father of Jehoram, had taken the high places and the Asherim out of Judah. But then he made a marriage alliance with Ahab. And Ahab's daughter became his daughter-in-law. And after he dies, his son rebuilds those high places. Now, what does it mean? Well, it means in some sense, at least in the, in, the, in the scope of fellowship, Jehoram got the message that, well, their friendship with Israel was very important. So important that he was married to them. So he went back and made the high places. Why did his father take them down? Well, I don't know. Israel never thought he needed to do that. He was just kind of, you know, he was kind of extreme. That's what people say. He was kind of extreme. He wanted to be very controlling, narrow-minded kind of guy. And that's what they say about it. But no, it's because he wanted to serve the Lord. He got this wrong, but... As a rule, he wanted to serve the Lord, and he did take the high places down, and that was right. That was pleasing. But his son put them back up. In the 13th verse of Second Chronicles 21, the prophetic word to him is, You have walked in the way of the kings of Israel and have enticed Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem into whoredom, as the house of Ahab led Israel into Horton. And also you've killed your brothers of your father's house who were better than you. Behold, the Lord will bring a great plague on your people, your children, your wives, all your possessions. You yourself will have a severe sickness with a disease of your bowels until your bowels come out because of the disease day by day. That's the prophecy. But go back for a moment. Notice what the prophet said that he did, 2 Chronicles 21, 18. Jehoram, son of Jehoshaphat, married to Ahab's daughter, walked in the way of the kings of Israel, enticed Judah and the inhabitants into whoredom. He did not follow in the ways of his father, Jehoshaphat, he did not walk in the ways of David, as many other kings, well, not many, as the good kings are said to have done. He walked in the way of the kings of Israel. And the kings of Israel were never good. Because Israel was never good. They broke away from the Lord. 
They had a false worship that used the Lord's name, but it wasn't really him. It was the calves that they set up, one in the south, one in the north, right? Dan and Bethel, because they wanted to keep the people worshiping somewhere close to them and not have to leave their borders to go into Judah to Jerusalem to worship, where their loyalties might change, where they might remember. Well, they wanted to make sure that didn't happen, so they set up two calves at Dan and Bethel. He said, long enough, too long you have gone, you have made the long journey to Jerusalem and established these two locations to serve you. That's how Israel worked. They were never right. And Jehoram joined with them. Why did he do it? Well, he's wrong. He's evil. He listened to his mother's counsel instead of to the word of the Lord. That could happen to anybody. The whole world is full of people who are listening to mother's counsel instead of the Bible. That happens all the time. But in part, it happened because Jehoshaphat did not get fellowship right. It happened in part because Jehoshaphat made a marriage alliance with the house of Israel. You've walked in the way of the kings of Israel. You've enticed Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem into whoredom. True, he took them back into the things that Je Jehoshaphat had taken them out of. <clears throat> the house of Ahab led Israel into whoredom. You have killed your brothers of your father's house who were better than you. <laughs> That's rough, but true. His brothers were better. He killed them. This is telling you the reason, see. It's not that they had their eyes on the throne, that they were some kind of uh, threat of usurpation, of uh, anarchy or rebellion, insurrection, anything of this nature. It's that they served the Lord. And if there's anything Israel hates, it's people who serve the Lord. Remember, the prophets were hiding in caves because Jezebel had a price on their heads. Yeah, they were better. That's why he killed them. Because of this, the Lord brings a great plague on the people, the children, the wives, the possessions, everything that this man has built with his evil is going to be taken away. And it says he will have this sickness, which does come to pass in the uh, 18th, 19th, and 20th verses. No pun intended, by the way. But it does come to pass. After all this, the Lord struck him in his bowels with an incurable disease. And I just think it's worth seeing this. It is recorded. I think the reason it's recorded is because we need to understand the ugly. This is what happens when you have fellowship with sin. When you go along to get along, when you make a pact, an agreement, a compromise, this is what happens. In the course of time, at the end of two years, his bowels came out because of the disease, and he died in great agony. Meaning his, his innards, his organs, his uh, uh, intestines, and whatever else is attached, actually came out of his anus until it killed him. Slowly, over two years. And he died in great agony, it says. That's a terrible death by any account. And why? Well, because he did evil. He did a great deal of evil. Somebody had done what was right and had built something that was good and had made changes and reforms in Judah, his father Jehoshaphat, and he just stomped on it all. He killed everybody who thought that they might want the kind of reign their father had had. That's, that's why God is mad at him. That's why this horrible thing happens. It didn't have to be like that. His people made no fire in his honor like the fires made for his fathers. He was 32 years old when he began to reign. He reigned eight years in Jerusalem and he departed with no one's regret. They buried him in the city of David, but not in the tombs of the kings. So kind of everybody hates this guy. It's unfortunate. 
Um, but he departed with no one's regret. He was an evil king. He reigned the way that Israel reigned. And, and when you think about that, Ahab and Jezebel, you can see the things that they did. If, if you're not familiar with the text, you, you can go back and read all the kinds of things they did. As we said, the prophets of the Lord are in hiding. That's terrible. But there was a man uh, who would not give the king his inheritance, which is against the law of Moses. It's a sin. They're not allowed to do that. But the king wanted it. He couldn't get it, so he pouted. And Jezebel said, Aren't you, are you the king or not? And he let her go. She caused that man to be killed so they could take his land, which they did. You talk about corrupt, evil, terrible reign. It's Ahab and Jezebel in Israel. And that's where Jehoshaphat makes a marriage alliance? Yeah, this one leaves Judah with, with no one's regret. Israel's used to this. That's how things are in Israel. But in Judah, they know, uh-uh, that's not the way this is supposed to be. I sure hope that more brethren start to see that. Now, 2 Chronicles 22. Continue. At verse 2. Another one comes up, Ahaziah. He's 22 years old. This is now uh, the grandson of Jehoshaphat. Ahaziah was 22 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned one year in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Athaliah, the granddaughter of Omri, who is Omri, that is Ahab's father. So she is a daughter of Ahab his mother. Oh, I'm sorry, she's a, yeah, yeah, no, that's right. She's granddaughter of Omri. She is in Ahab's family. Maybe not Ahab's daughter, but maybe his niece, something like that, but it's, it's all in the family. That was Ahaziah's mother, Ataliah. He also walked in the ways of the house of Ahab, for his mother was his counselor in doing wickedly. He did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, as the house of Ahab had done. For after the death of his father, the house of Ahab were his counselors to his undoing. So this one also walked in the ways of Ahab. His mother was from Ahab's family. So the king after Jehoshaphat is trash and murders all the other kings who would have reigned the way Jehoshaphat would. Well, uh, that's, that's bad. What happened to all of those faithful men? Well, they couldn't eat. Oh, okay. So another generation arises, and unfortunately, it's also tainted by the fellowship with Ahab. And this one has a counselor in his mother and in the house of Ahab, telling him to do evil things after the death of his father. They waited until dad wasn't in the room anymore. But once he was gone out of the picture, then they moved in and did what they really believed. They were not kind to him the way that he tried to be kind to them. Remember, this is not about the, this is not about the children. Although it's true, the children did wrong, and we should think about why they did this. This lesson is about Jehoshaphat in the court of Ahab. He wanted to be nice to them. He wanted to build bridges and keep the lines of communication open, and all the things that people say when they want to be compromisers of the faith. Do you think that this is what he wanted? Did he want to see his son follow the, the ways of Ahab? Did he want to see all of his other sons murdered? Did he want to see his grandson raised by the house of Ahab? No, he was trying to be nice. They weren't. They never were. And they never are. If they don't believe in God, why should you trust them? If they cannot honor God, if they cannot respect God, then why do you think they will give you any kind of honor or respect? 
They won't. When the time is right, they'll slit your throat. So after the death of his father, they were his counselors to his undoing. He even followed their counsel and went with Jehoram, son of Ahab, king of Israel, to make war. Against Hazael, king of Syria, at Ramoth Gilead. The very thing that Jehoshaphat had gone, he went down to Ahab's court and Ahab said, Hey, come with me to Ramoth Gilead. Remember that? That's where we started. The very thing that, in some sense, began this sequence of events. Uh, he went right back to it. This is how much they care for Jehoshaphat's thinking, for Jehoshaphat's sensibilities. Um, yes, God was merciful to him and pulled him out. I think he didn't realize what he was doing. But the consequences are nonetheless dire. And that's what we want to get across to to uh, to us, you know, for for our purposes today, so that we don't do the same thing. The Syrians wounded Joram. He returned to be healed in Jezreel of the wounds he had received at Ramach. Uh oh, Jezreel. What's Jezreel? Anybody remember that one? <laughs> That's the land that Jezebel stole by murdering that man. Do you think that the Lord noticed that? And Ahaziah, son of Jehoram, king of Judah, went down to visit Joram, son of Ahab, in Jezreel because he was wounded. Oh, he's very worried about the wounded son of Ahab. Forget about the murdered uncles. They were a bunch of dummies. But it was ordained by God that the downfall of Ahaziah should come about through his going to visit Joram. This is a fellowship issue, you see. What if Ahaziah had said to himself, you know, this is not right. I'm going to cut ties with these people. Well, he wouldn't have died. But the Lord said, you go down there and make them your family and treat them nicer than you treat my servants, that's the end. It's over. That's what happened. It was ordained by God that the downfall of Ahaziah should come about through his going to visit Joram. People just really want to believe that it doesn't matter. Why, you can always be kind. You can always go visit and talk. No, no, you can't. There are very specific times in the New Testament where this is forbidden. You don't have fellowship with sin. You don't welcome false teachers into your home. And that is how downfall happens. Well, when Ahaziah got, came there, he went out with Jehoram to meet the man who has a prophetic word, Jehu, son of Nimshi. The thing about going to meet Jehu is, well, God had anointed Jehu to destroy the house of Ahab. He was on a mission that God sent him on to destroy Ahab's household. And when he gets there, well, well, well. <laughs> what do we have here? I came to destroy Ahab's house. Are you part of Ahab's house, Ahaziah? It sure looks like you are. Uh-huh. When Jehu was executing judgment on the house of Ahab, he met the princes of Judah, the sons of Ahaziah's brothers who attended Ahaziah, and he killed them. Then he searched for Ahaziah, and Ahaziah was captured while hiding in Samaria, and he was brought to Jehu and put to death. He went into hiding in Samaria. He thought he was going to get strength from Israel. Again, no, you're not. They don't care. They don't have principles. They're not going to protect you. They don't have your back. When push comes to shove, you'll be on your own. If you want 
if you want people to stand with you, you know, there's always going to be a time when they don't. But the Lord stood with me, says Paul, 2 Timothy 4. If you always want to have somebody standing with you, well, that is the Lord God. And you do that by serving him faithfully, by doing his word and his commandments, no matter what people think about it. And you might have people that walk away from you. You might have family ties that are severed and friendships that come to an end, things and conversa conversations that are uh, uh, uncomfortable. But understand, friend, this that happened to them, There's this is not... Uh, anything special. This is not anything unusual. This is exactly what happens every time it happens. Those who do not fear God, those who hate God, who teach error, this is what they're really, really like. And the end of trusting them is going to be like this. You can't hide. They won't. Go. They don't have your back. He was brought to Jehu and put to death, and they buried him because... They said, he's the grandson of Jehoshaphat who sought the Lord with all his heart. Yeah, the only thing he, this king had going for him was that he was Jehoshaphat's grandson, and they still remember that Je Jehoshaphat had been a good king, which was only about nine years earlier. They still remember Jehoshaphat was good. That's the only thing this guy had going for him. And the house of Ahaziah had no one able to rule the kingdom. Which is the point at which his mother, Athaliah, seizes the throne and reigns as queen mother for a time over Judah, of all things. That's how Judah got a queen mother, which people forget. They always want to beat on Israel. Oh, Israel, you know, they went away for the Lord. They built the calves and all. They're all mean and mad about Israel. But look, Judah had a queen mother. Literally. How did that happen? Well, Ahab made a marriage alliance, or uh, Je Jehoshaphat made a marriage alliance with Ahab. That's how it happened. How did she get there? That's how. Shouldn't have been. Shouldn't have existed. And that, unfortunately, that's the end. I'm sorry, it's kind of dark, but that's the end. I mean, it's back to what we said before. Should you help the wicked and love those who hate the Lord? That There's going to be a price. You, you know, the fool is you. Where did I hear that? I recently heard. Hmm. Gamblers, you know, hustlers and pool and poker and whatever else. They said, if you're sitting down at the table and a half hour passes and you still don't know who the stooge is, it's you. You're the one who's being gamed. That's the way that this is in the fellowship. Jehoshaphat's going into this and he's making friends and he's making alliances and he keeps trying. He never stops to think, well, who keeps getting their way? Why are we doing it that way? How come they don't listen when I ask for the word of the Lord? Why did he say he hated the Lord's prophet? Why don't any of these questions occur to him? He's the stooge at the table. And so is every Christian who makes fellowship with Christians who practice error. You're the stooge. They're not going to change for you. It's going to go the other way around. It, you're going to get hurt. So don't put yourself in that situation. And again, I think this is why it is an elementary principle. It's one of the first things that people learn in the faith. You have to learn what you can touch and what you can't touch, what you should be part of and what you should steer away from. And it's fairly simple. 
it should have been obvious that they shouldn't have had anything to do with Ahab. So, that's that. Jehoshaphat in Ahab's court. His open fellowship led to a lot of bad things. Um, he himself did good things, but the alliance that he made led to a lot of very bad things. The loss of his uh, family, the loss of a king over Judah, the loss of many souls who were led astray from the faith that is in Moses, or rather in God through Moses, when his son introduced idolatry again. He likely did not have any of those things in mind when he did this. He thought he was keeping the lines of communication open, making it possible for them to come back to the Lord. But the Lord does not need your help. It's a nice thought. It's kind and loving, but the Lord does not need your help. You don't get to decide whether somebody can repent or not. They can repent if they repent, and God will forgive them if he forgives them. And uh, he doesn't consult you and me on the matter. So go back to the original idea. Keep yourself pure. Think about what you're doing and laying hands to. Think about what the consequences of that can be when you are trying to steer clear. Thank you for your kind attention. We speak of obedience to the gospel every time we come together as God's children. And this is not an exception. If today you are not yet a child of God, it is time for you to obey the gospel of Jesus before it is too late. There is water uh, available, we'll find it, we will get you there, that you might be baptized in the name of Jesus for forgiveness of sins. And you might keep yourself pure, keep aloof from these evil things and evil influences that do not honor and serve him. Today, if you are a Christian who has not lived right, repent, make things right with him, pray God for forgiveness earnestly in the heart, and he will. But we also are willing to pray for you, with you, that you might be restored to him, that you might be strengthened, that we also might be strengthened. Because very, very likely, whatever it is that you are struggle, struggling with or whatever it is that has tripped you up is something that we ourselves have also struggled with or tripped on at some point, time in the past. If we can help you with our prayers, if we can help you to obey the gospel, let that need be known now while we sing the song that Ethan has selected.